this allows me to go live. Go live? Is it going live? Okay, yeah, it's going live now. All right, my dear, before we go on, um, I usually put some banners up here um, and like a little creative that I have um, just yeah. to kind of get things going. So I'm going to start it off with this. Let's go. Let's get it. Let's go. Let's get it. Let's go. Let's get it. Let's go. Let's get. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> That's just to get a little bit of energy in the room, <laughs> as not That's as if good. we didn't have any ourselves, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. I have the energy inside of me. <laughs> oh, I love that. I felt that. I felt that. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Fran and Friends. As you know, uh, Friday is usually our days for the live stream, but Saturday we have special guests sometimes on the show and Mary Ode is one of them. So I'm gonna read Mary O's bio because she has such an extensive uh, background that I can't remember it all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Mary Ode, she's a holistic health coach, and she's been a yoga instructor for 25 years. She helps women regain health with the change of their nutrition. And she addresses their health problems, pardon me, at a time to sustain proper essential nutrients that they need throughout their lives to feel good emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And I'm really glad that you touch on all those things, um, especially the spiritual part, because I think that's an area that sometimes is um, discounted. Let me see. And I agree. Um, I agree yes. Yeah. And give me just a second. I'm getting back down to the bio. So it says, without our health, we have nothing. And she's absolutely right. We can have all the money in the world with no health and you can't do anything with the material gains. So she said that the key is to listen to ourselves, to take time for ourselves, to nourish our bodies and our spirits daily. Life is a constant flux that they change, that we change because things change around us, but inwardly is where the true life exists. I really love that. She said that her approach yeah, she said that her approach is totally unconventional and she doesn't try to fit in with what others do. And I would love for you to share more what that is. Um, and also just a bit about your uh, background because it says that you're a French yogini and for some people they may not know what that is. So please <laughs> share. <laughs> Well, the, there's no real secret to that. I, that that just means that I'm French and was born in France and raised in France, uh, and so I kind of use <laughs> this this little uh, part of me as an advantage. Um, and so, anyway, I've uh, I've learned all of my yoga in the in the U.S. Uh, so I moved when I was fairly young, I was still um, a, a teenager, a young lady. And uh, um, my journey, <clears throat> my journey was, I was really seeking spirituality since the very beginning. I didn't really know it, but I, I felt an empty void inside and I just needed to find something. And uh, yoga was the means that I found uh, the spirituality that I follow now and the spiritual teacher that I, uh, that I have in my life. And um, that changed me completely. But it started with yoga. So, and it took me a while. I was told many times over, um, <clears throat> find, uh, uh, go do some yoga, find a spiritual teacher. And I was like, ah, whatever, whatever. You know, I was in my 20s. <laughs> and all you want to do is play well that was my case um you know go out party have fun i lived in new york city i moved uh, there when i was um i wasn't even 20 yet so i was very very young and um 
and so all you want to do is have fun. But <laughs> and that's kind of normal, and I, we should have fun and explore. Uh, anyway, and so eventually I tagged along with a friend of mine who uh, was going to this yoga uh, session in the evening, and I was like, all right, I'll go, and that was the end. That's when it all started, I should say. <laughs> Well, she but had an I, event or your friend had an event and they just invited you and you just fell in love with the practice of yoga? Yeah, I just knew this was for me and I had to continue. Yeah, it was a yoga class in New York City. There's many. <laughs> but uh, she had invited me many times over and this was the right time. I was. Uh, I had actually moved away from New York. I had lived there for seven years. Then I moved back to Paris. I got married. Then I came back to the US and I was really seeking then. I was searching. I was in my late uh, 20s at that time. So um, maybe 28, 29, something like that. And I just, there was a big void that I needed to fill. And uh, so the yoga got me on the spiritual path. You know, you start learning about, you start listening. This is where it, it, you start listening inside, which before it's all noise outside. Uh, you know, everything's bombarded at you. Although we didn't have the social media that we do today, which is, I don't know how the younger crowd does it today, honestly. <laughs> It's overwhelming, but um, living in New York City, I mean, it's a fast-paced city. Uh, it's about your career, you know, all of that. So anyway, so <laughs> the yoga came into my life and it was like, ah, yeah, thank you. And, and so it just helped me with um, mentally, emotionally as well. And also you, at that age, you, you're searching for yourself. I think, you know, when we're young, we're searching. We, we don't really know what's going on. So, <laughs> so I like yoga, my, I you with them um, uh, from the distractions. It yes, helps you to find a, a yeah. place of balance. Yes, you just you're able to be in a room with other people who are seeking or want the same thing, and you just uh, well, not only we do the uh, physical activity of the yoga, but there's meditation involved or. Um, you know, you have to slow down and you have to hear what's going on inside that head, which is not pretty sometimes, especially when you start. I think starting is probably the hardest because um, you don't realize that there's all these negative thinking that goes on in, in our head, you know, when we slow down. And uh, the anger that I had a lot of anger, I didn't even realize it. I just, wow. you know, I'm feeling empty, feeling just betrayed for whatever reason you know just feeling not myself not whole you know anyway so that was the journey that i embarked on and that, that was the reason why i came to the u.s i had a, a, a drive inside that brought me here <laughs> it was and just you didn't, know, you didn't know what was driving the anger and the resentment inside you just knew that you wanted to find a place a, a place of peace Yes. Um, well, you know, you, when you are a young person, you have um, maybe issues with your parents, which I did, you know, the way they raised us. And, and there was nothing wrong with my family. They were just, my parents were just regular folks. And um, I had a really good childhood. There's nothing to complain about, but there's always something, you know, when you live with other people. And then as a teenager, we have resentments, which are unfounded, of course. And, but we have, it's part of growing up. We have to learn to resolve these things for ourselves. Um, and when I came to this country, this was my, the beginning of doing that. Um, you know, uh, I had resentment towards my mom and different things. And, and then I realized it wasn't her, it was me. It, uh, you know, it starts with us. And then uh, once you can forgive and realize that um, we have a part in whatever happens in our lives, um, it just everything started to open up and change. Totally. And, um, yeah. <laughs> no, no, please finish. I, I, I was just agreeing out loud, which I'm there was not. one thing that I uh, <laughs> had um, that happened uh, all my childhood. Uh, I had nightmares that, I mean, it wasn't every day, but regularly where I had this clown that was running after me in my 
nightmares. This mm. ugly clown, and he was really scary. And all I could do was run away from him and when it happened. And, you know, I would wake up scared to crazy, you know, like almost sweating and all that. And when I came to the U.S., um, that was a big deal for me because when I came to the U.S., I had that dream again, and I stood up to him. I turned around, I faced oh. the clown, and he disappeared like it never existed. Hmm. So, uh, you know, we, ha- we can have fears inside of us. And um, it was very interesting. And so things change. A lot of things change, change from that time on. That's beautiful. <laughs> Uh, what do you think made you stand up? Because all that, all the time, you said that when you were a kid, you you were running away from this character, right? Yes. But all of a sudden, um, when you came I, here, is it because of the change or the transition of location, or maybe the new spirituality so. kind of? Yeah, I think so. I think being uh, living in New York City, I lived in Manhattan. Everything was very different. I felt um, welcome and at home, and I was really welcome. Uh, people loved the fact that I had a French accent. I was like, "Wow, okay." <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, my English wasn't so good. I couldn't have a conversation. I could have never done what we're doing right now. Uh, I could only, uh, you know, just ask a few questions, and I, I just, most of the time I said nothing because I couldn't. Speak have a conversation it's hard to have a conversation (laughs) in another language but uh yeah it was very different and i just um i i met i was meant to be there i felt totally at home when i moved to uh new york city i loved it it was fantastic i don't live there now and i'm quite happy about that too so (laughs) (laughs) okay where, where are you based now so now I live in the southwest of the U.S. in New Mexico. Okay. Cool. Close to Albuquerque in the mountains. I'm at about uh, 7,000 feet in altitude. Ooh. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if people really know what today's topic is about, but if for those of you that are just tuning in, um, we're talking about recovering from brain damage because uh, Mario uh, she had a tragic accident which caused um, the brain damage. And I wanted to see if you could share with us a little bit what that journey looked like. Yeah, so traumatic brain injury is a a very strange event. Um, And most people really don't know what it's all about, which is understandable. Unless you've gone through one, there's really nothing you can really understand about it. Uh, But um, it's strange too, because the person usually will look the same. So you have no clue as to what is happening inside the head of that person or the handicap. I mean, I, so I would tell, when I went through the brain injury, I would tell people I'm handicapped. I know you don't, think I am, because <laughs> I look the same, and physically I look fine, uh, but I'm handicapped, so I had to ask for a lot of help around me, strangers, anybody that was near me, if I, I was out and about uh, shopping or just, you know, getting some groceries or <clears throat> going to even the doctor, and, uh, but uh, yeah, I had a car accident, I was rear-ended at a red light, and that changed my life completely on the spot. You ran a red uh, light or somebody ran a red light and they hit you? No, uh, somebody, uh, we were stopped at a red light. It was rush uh-huh. hour and the guy behind me didn't notice that th- we were stopped. So I stopped him, my car stopped him. Ooh. And so we were doing about 35 miles an hour. I mean, I was stopped at that point, but he, he was, and he had a big SUV. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, it was fate. It was meant to be. And uh, in some ways, you know, I uh, like I mentioned to you before, uh, it changes you for the better. And um, the experience was really deep and uh, intense. It was really hard to live, I must admit. But um, it I helped like me were- go... You don't look like somebody that experienced brain damage. But then again, the question is, what do people with brain damage look like, right? 
they don't it's unless you have uh, in the eyes you can tell like a lot of people a lot of my students told me that they, they looked at me and i wasn't really there and, mm. <laughs> and it's true i wasn't there you're uh in a daze you're somewhere else you know you just uh, also you there could be a disconnect with the physical and um your you know the astral plane plane the the mm the yeah well you're mental as well but there could be a disconnect which is completely normal it's it's the way we um it's the way we protect ourselves from a, a major trauma it happens naturally it's not like you have to induce yourself with anything could you clarify so, what, that, uh, what that means uh for some, because some viewers that are watching because you mentioned something about astral plane yeah, so we live in the physical plane, right? We have a physical body, we have face, you know, everything. And um, the, the, the plane above that is the astral plane. So it's, it, we can compare it to the emotional aspect of us. And so <clears throat> when, uh, when we can have trauma, we just disconnect from the physical, even though we still live in the physical body, but we live more in the astral just like when somebody has a, um, it's hard to explain, but uh, just like somebody who is in a coma, they are in the astral plane. So they're regenerating and healing and doing all of that. Whether they come back into their body to continue their life as a, a phys in the physical, mm -hmm. we don't know, but uh, that's what so, happens. So it's, it's like a spiritual plane, the astral plane. Yes. Yes. Okay. There's a few more beyond that, but that's one of the planes, yeah. So, um, yeah, and I, I know I wasn't really in my body very often because I couldn't. It just was too, it just was very hard to, uh, it's, when your brain is not working, you cannot, you don't even know how to brush your teeth. You don't know how to dress yourself anymore. You don't know how to do your hygiene. It's very hard. You have to relearn everything. And uh, wow. the, when, it, when it happened, uh, the next day I had class. And uh, so first of all, I couldn't remember what, uh, I mean, I didn't even know who I was anymore. Wow. I was like, well, I don't even know if I have class today. I knew there was yoga involved in my life. And so I had to look, somehow I had to find out how and I, uh, that I did have a class that evening. So it took me half a day to put an email together with two lines saying I had a car accident. I, I cannot teach today and for the rest of the week you know, forgive me and I'll be in touch. And that was that, uh, something like wow. that, you know. That took me uh, literally half a day to put that together because I couldn't compute how to do it. It was too complicated. So when did you find out that um, these these tasks that you were doing that are so simple, like simple, at what yeah. point did you identify that, oh, okay, well, I I need to go see somebody to help me with this yeah, so I, uh, because of the health coaching, and I, I've been doing this for quite a long time, and I'm, I'm holistic, I don't really visit doctors that much, except for chiropractors, naturopathic doctors, or, you know, massage, those kind of modalities. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that I needed to see somebody right away. Um, and so I contacted, I didn't know how bad my, that I, I didn't even know I had a brain injury. I just knew something was wrong with me. <laughs> I didn't know what. Uh, and so I called this massage therapist, uh, if I could get a massage and just to, you know, get me back on track or some, something like this. And she said to me, oh, no, 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 you need to go to the ER. You need to get diagnosed. You need to make sure you don't have a brain injury. You need to, you know, all of that. Right. And she's like, I can't see you until you have been seen by a medical doctor. And it was the best advice that I could have ah, gotten. Okay. It was very wise of her, and I appreciate that. Um, and so I actually contacted my chiropractor, and um, he was on vacation, so I had to see somebody else that my backup. And he saw me uh, the next day. And you should never go to the chiropractor the, the day of the accident. You should wait a few days so the, because the body seizes wow. and tightens up and goes through transformation. And you want to let it to, um, you want to let the body to just start relaxing and start 
coming into its own, even though it might be the spine might be off and everything, you know, maybe a little distorted. Uh, you want to so wait until survival mode once once that happens. You what? I, I said your body pardon? when when she mentioned to go to the ER, and you yeah. also mentioned that our body is tensed up, so our body is basically in a in a survival mode. Yes. It's, okay. it's, it's going through the trauma still. Okay. And so the body is not ready to be worked with at this point. At that time, I didn't know I had a brain injury, even though I had all these issues with like putting an email together mm -hmm. or uh, doing anything. I was just a little bit in, uh, I was stumped still. And I, you know, uh, that, yeah, the, that night after it happened, uh, the next morning, uh, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I, I just, I was crying and that's that's the brain injury i know that now i was distraught and i i didn't know what was happening and i was crying and i just couldn't stop and there was no real reason for it <laughs> it's just i was wow. in trauma so anyway uh, when i went to see the doctor he um he did go through all the um the protocols that they go through in case of a car accident because there could be a brain injury or other issues and so he asked me a number of questions and all of that uh, sort of stuff to just see if uh, you asked me what year we were in. I was going to uh, ask you what, he, what, what, those, what those questions were. Yeah, so things like that. They asked me what's the, who's the president, where do you, you know, what's your name, what do you, where do you live, you know, things like that. And uh, I forget exactly. I wrote down a bunch of questions that he, um, he asked me. But um the thing is, so he didn't diagnose me with the brain injury. He thought, oh, no, you're fine. And um, you cannot remember what happened the minute before. So he was asking me things like, um, uh, I don't remember exactly, but uh, I couldn't remember what had happened like 15 minutes ago. I didn't even know. Like he could have asked me, what did you have for breakfast? And that would have been a great question because I wouldn't have been able to answer him at all, mm. like literally at all. And uh, so he didn't diagnose me with the brain injury and um, he gave me uh, an adjustment at that time, um, which I think uh, was not, I mean, it kind of relieved me physically a little bit, but um, it, it wasn't until a week later and I had a few students that were friends of mine that insisted, they were like, you know, Mario, you don't know what's going on. You should go to the ER and just make sure you don't have anything you know, worse than that. And I had a French friend who I was texting. That's the only thing I could do is text. That was fairly easy. I could put a few words together. And this uh, young man, he's the one who really insisted, actually. And he had been, um, he's an American uh, citizen now, and so he's gone to uh, war, actually. He was with the military. And he's had uh, a few concussions, so he knew about it. <laughs> and he said, Mario, you need to go to get to the, to the ER. And so I went, and, and that's how I got diagnosed. But uh, I almost didn't stay, you know, I, you know, how, have you been to the ER? It's an awful thing to, to do. Yes, they, I have. They, it is an they, awful yeah. place to be. Yeah, they keep you around. So that was uh, in 2016, so before COVID, but they keep you around forever, you know, and I went in the evening, so I, it took eight hours before I could see somebody, so. Yep, that I sounds like a normal ER time. visit. Yeah. It's, That's so great that you had those friends to, um, really push you into going to see some, you know, seeking yeah. medical advice, uh, especially uh, when they observed that your behavior wasn't uh, normal. So yes, somebody was I looking out for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. I'm hard headed. I just don't like to go to hospitals, doctors and all of that. It's just too, it's painful to me. And they don't listen. I was very lucky. I met this uh, young medical doctor and she was really amazing. And I, I, she listened to me carefully. She was asking me all these kinds of questions. And she was, we were having a conversation with, instead of the doctor talking at you, you know, 
and uh, you know being like superior to you meanwhile it's like i'm the one with all the problems you know and so she was very different in her approach and uh she uh, said yeah you do and so they did a scat scan i didn't have any bleeding in the brain or in which was really the important part you can't see anything on a cat's uh cat scan Scan. There's nothing to be seen. No, you mm. can't. Oh, anyway, that's awesome. That it, it's so interesting when we do have um, doctors or practitioners that are really in tune, wanting to know what the client's needs are. I think we can have better dialogue when we do have those kind of conversations versus trying to push something on. Uh, the client. And I'm not saying that doctors do do that, but you're right. There is this superiority complex that I, I've experienced when I went to the doctor, like, okay, I know better than you. It's like, oh, okay, cool. You're not yeah, the wisdom in this world. Yeah. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. And that's why I avoid those kind of offices. I mean, you, obviously there's always great doctors and all, right. but, um, and they're just stuck in one way and they don't even understand about health. Uh, I mean, uh, about nutrition, which is the base of your, our health. That was and like when I, ask you. Yeah, yeah. When I work with people, uh, one-on-one, -on -one, um, the the key is to really listen so i ask a lot of questions but i listen to their story and usually people will not tell you everything right away because they don't realize that's important mm -hmm. and so you have to really dig in and the more you ask the more you get the answers you need to have to actually uh, help them in their health journey with supplementation the right diet and then you know yoga if uh, you know usually they want yoga as well but that's how I approach it. And just a, a kind ear to, uh, the, for the person changes everything. Suddenly they feel better. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, and it's the truth, right? It's, it's, a, a simple, it's a simple act of care and love. Mm -hmm. And I think doctors today don't you know, do that that much, you know, except for the, uh, the ones that are uh, holistic. Yeah, and people just want to be heard and seen, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they're here to to find an answer and solutions. Right. And so, yeah, we should be all of that. I mean, I'm not a doctor, just to be clear. I'm not a physician right. of any really kind, but, um, uh, you know, you can address uh, most of the health the, uh, issues we have today through uh, foods, if you know what you're doing, and, um, and then help yourself with the herbal remedies or some kind of supplements. And um, yeah, I believe so. I actually yeah. wholeheartedly <laughs> believe that. So, yeah, that, so um, just, that. just for people that are watching on social media, this is not a medical advice at all. We're just sharing no. our experiences of what we've experienced with uh, practitioners, um, things that we may have uh, applied in our own lives as far as a holistic approach. So this is just stories that we're sharing from our point of view. And speaking of nutrition, you mentioned to me that you use nutrition to heal your brain injury. Please share with us what that journey looked like. So yeah, the Immediately after, I, you know, the next few days after the brain injury, all I could think about was a uh, red, juicy steak, bloody. Uh, that's all I could think about. It was right there in my third eye. And it was like I just craved it so bad. It was unbelievable. And I never really ate much red meat before. I, um, I had been a vegetarian for 15 years um, two or three years prior to my brain injury. And I had started to reincorporate meat because I realized that I was killing myself <laughs> on the vegetarian diet. I was depleted of many vitamins. I was going to ask you, what, do you, what did you mean by that? Because you said you practiced um, being a vegetarian for 15 years, but then yeah. just three years ago... Was in retrospect today, uh, I mean, obviously, every, every experience is valuable, but it was a big mistake. And um, it was this big trend. It still is today. It's a huge trend to be vegetarian and not eat meat. I was raised on raw milk, cheese, butter, uh, meat, uh, you know, every day. This is how we were raised. My dad was from the farm and we ate everything, but <clears throat> meat uh, and, and uh, meat products 
uh, fat, we ate pork, um, we, uh, everything was done at the farm. Uh, we, uh, we were raised like that. And so we, the genes are good when it's like that. I, I truly believe that we are meant to eat meat. So anyway, with the brain injury, the most important part of our diet has to be red meat, not even you know, chicken, I mean, you can have any kind of meat you want, but the red meat is the most important, mostly beef or uh, from large ruminant animals like elk and so on and so forth. So uh, every day, every meal I ate um, a lot because it gave me the energy and it would help me with my brain. Uh, I ate a lot. I mean, I just ate my three meals, which I never did before. I, I ate mostly two meals. That was enough. You know, for but you, I needed to eat more. What exactly did the meat do for your, your I guess, the neurons in your brains? In yeah, your brain, so... In your brain. Um, <laughs> the, the neurons, we all have neurons. When, uh, so there's a period of die-off during uh, the brain injury, and it's cumulative, and it, it, will, it takes, uh, from my experience and the way I experienced it from inside, um, it took, a, I think it was about two, three weeks of die off where things were getting worse by the day, right? So uh, the, the, the brain injury progresses because you have the trauma and then it's not just boom, the lights are out or you're just this new person that can't function. It's more of a progressive uh, evolution that happens to you and then you're like, you just, things just don't work anymore. <laughs> and so uh, you can't think, you can't remember anything. Um, I had to put post-its everywhere in my house to remind myself uh, at this time, do this. Um, like cooking was really dangerous actually, because I would leave things on the stove, not knowing that I had put any food to, to prepare. So I, I actually acquired a, um, uh, I forget what they call those little dinky little stoves there that um, uh, a toaster oven. That's it. That's, that's oh, yeah, what it yeah, is. The little yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I don't know. Enough, but it was a life saving because I would put my food in there to be cooked, and uh, you know, there's a timer, and so you can time it for how long you want it. And when it stops, it stops, it dings. So it would tell me, oh, I would hear the ding, and I'd be like, oh. Some, did I prepare some food? So I'd go back there and I'd be like, oh yeah, I did prepare some food because <laughs> I would not remember anything. So yes, the, to get back to the red meat, uh, it's the most important thing that you can do. The, um, the, the animal fat and animal protein is probably one of the number one uh, products that we need to consume as, uh, as humans. And uh, so I got on a ketogenic diet, not knowing that that even existed. I didn't know the name of it. It just was natural. My body, my brain, everything was craving. Just get on the meat. I couldn't eat uh, nuts. Uh, it would give me canker sore. I'd react. I'd have allergies to everything. Uh, I, I couldn't eat um, grains at all because um, it transforms into sugar. And my brain would just start going on fire. It was just crazy. And it was within minutes. So I had complete reaction to any of that. I didn't eat any fruit at all um, because I couldn't. The fructose is so, so intense. not even the natural sugar? No. Wow. I, I couldn't do sugar. And I wanted to sometimes, but I just couldn't. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you'd want to have other things than just that, but, um, and yeah, you, I couldn't do it. I couldn't have muffins, bread. I would have, uh, when down the road, maybe a year or so later, I was able to have one slice of bread a, a day, <laughs> but that was the maximum. Any more than that, and my brain would react, or my brain would react in a way that uh, it would become sappy and um, not functional. It's even worse than before. So, so I just um, I'm very sensitive, so and I'm intuitive, so I just followed what my body wanted. And turns out that there's a diet called keto, <laughs> ketogenic yeah. diet. And, and so that's what I really was on. I would eat vegetables and meat, vegetables and meat, cheese. Uh, I couldn't have milk, um, cheese, and then um, 
you know, bacon, eggs, eggs, I could do eggs. Yeah, that was my diet. And uh, I did see a professional at some point who specialized in brain injury. And uh, we had some conversation. Uh, no, I did not. But uh, he was a, a chiropractor that specialized in brain injuries. And so he had different treatments that he would do with the tongue, uh, eye exercises to um, help the brain repair the neurons and things like that. Um, and he, uh, we had conversation about that and he's about the nutrition. And he said, yeah, the, my patients who do the worst are my younger patients because they're all vegetarian. And he said, oh. hey, those who are vegetarian do very badly. And they're usually the younger crowd because it's a trend. You know, it's a, we've been brainwashed to think this is better. It's not better. Wow. <laughs> like my daughter, not- she's a vegetarian. And I was like, I adapted myself into, uh, or I tried to, but I really like chicken. <laughs> like chicken. Yeah, chicken is great. I have chickens. I have 20 <laughs> hens here. I raise chicken. Oh, you live on a farm? Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's about awesome. 12 acres here. Yeah, it's big. And so I have chickens and, you know, I, I like eggs. I don't eat my chickens because they're my family, but uh, we eat their eggs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so you um, said that um, the chiropractor, he specialized in the brain injury and he was providing you like a dietary like, no list. nothing with nutrition unfortunately um but um it was more about he had this whole program and i don't know what it's called i probably have written that in my book you know because i, I kept uh, a record of everything every day was my um it was therapeutic i needed to do it um to express myself and not only that it helped me remember uh, when I reread my book, I was like, I had no clue many of the things that I wrote that it happened to me. I didn't know. So I would write it in the moment. You know, uh, every day I would write a little something, uh, especially big, big event, uh, sometimes interaction with people where it was really, um, it wasn't very good, you know, and how people don't understand what's happening. And they don't, thought, they don't know. They don't know I, the handicap. I thought that you meant that you wrote a book. Did you write a book? Yeah, I wrote, a, it's a book basically. It's a self-help guide to uh, during a brain injury. So it's meant for people who have brain trauma. I didn't realize that. Oh my gosh. Okay, so at the end, please share that with but people. But no, the book is not published. Uh, oh, it's, it's not- written. It needs to be edited and that will come down the road. I, you know, I'm ready now. I couldn't do it before. It was just too okay. much. Um, We have four minutes before we wrap up into our uh, personal question section. For people that have um, experienced these type of injuries, are there, oh, you know, you didn't even touch on the yoga part. I mean, you did in the beginning, but what are... say about the yoga if you want uh, I developed during so I was teaching the entire time I, I cut down uh, my teachings in third because I could barely function but I still need to I lived alone so I still need needed to subsist I'm not independently wealthy so <laughs> I needed to make a living somehow and so I developed this different type of yoga to to help me and uh, I offered it to my students and it became one of the most popular classes. Oh, it was wow. actually packed. So that was pretty funny. <laughs> what, is, what, what is that technique, technique called? Uh, what is it called? Yeah, what's the technique called? Uh, so it's a, it's a blend between um, a therapeutic yoga and, um, oh, I forget the name now. Uh, it will come back to me. Uh, a restorative yoga. So it's a blend between the two. So the restorative yoga, it's mostly um, you're sleeping with a bolster, basically. (laughs) But this class is passive stretch and 
while you do some deep breathing. And so people, when they come out, you, it's not strenuous in any ways. And I had to do something like that because every time I did too much, the next day I'd have to stay in bed, uh, close all the blinds. I couldn't stand the light, uh, just don't, no noise. I mean, I would be incapacitated. So I'd have to be very careful how much I did each day. Uh, my life was uh, basically the life of a 90-year-old in a 50-year-old's body, you know, I, and I, with the mind of a five-year-old. So that's basically wow. how you sum it up. That's exactly what happens. <laughs> my dad was his, uh, in his 90s at the time, and I said, Dad, you know, uh, he, was, he was like, I need to nap in the afternoon now. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, I do the same, <laughs> and I have to sleep for <laughs> like four or five hours you know the afternoon is a long afternoon of sleeping basically i would sleep 12 hours a night and uh i'd go teaching a class and i only instructed i didn't do the yoga for most of my classes and i'd run home in a rush and run to bed and all i could think about sleep 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 and i'd sleep for four or five hours and sometimes wow. i had a class in the evening so that's how it went so how did that feel for you, knowing that you are this strong body, but yet you had to alleviate this trauma that you really were still trying to come into grips with? Like, what what was going through your mind with, because that had to feel like an out-of-body experience almost. It was. Uh, well, I didn't have any vanity in that way where people are really, we can be attached to, you know, to uh, the way that we are physically strong, we feel good and all that. Mm -hmm. I, you live in the moment and you, you have no choice because you don't remember past, future, it just doesn't matter. You're right here, right now, what's going on right now. So that's, and then the spirituality is what saved me. And so without that, I, uh, you know, I mentioned that to you before. I would have taken my life for sure a long time ago. Uh, the spirituality was what held me together, and so. And, but I've, I have been on my spiritual path for many years already. At that time, so you know, sixteen, seventeen years. I, I'm not sure at the time, and so. Um, <clears throat> I had been anchored already inside with some wealth of spirituality. And so, so I had something to go back to. And I was able to read, like some people cannot after a brain injury. For me, I had no issue. So I could read, I could do my contemplation, I could go in my head and, and uh, just have, uh, you know, ex spiritual experiences. And so uh, that really saved me. That really saved me. And that was part of the healing. Without that, I don't think. I think... People who uh, don't have either prayer or meditation or something spiritual or faith of some kind, <clears throat> they do really badly actually with the brain injury. Wow. And, and often they, it will push them into having some kind of uh, searching for some kind of faith or something. To, um, and, and it helps you. And we talked about that last time where um, when you go into meditation, your brain starts repairing the neurons and uh, your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. And there's many studies on that shows how change the, the pituitary gland starts, uh, the pineal gl gland starts um, growing actually and expanding in a healthy manner. And many things change over time. It's, uh, it's fascinating, but yeah, it's all about spirituality. <laughs> well, Mar Mario, thank you so much for um, joining us. I know before we started the show that um, I would like for people to know where to find you and then also too, so they can keep up with you. So that way they know when your book is being published because people need that. They need to hear your voice and your story is so important. I mean, because who comes out of a brain injury and are you now... Right. Uh, what are the statistics on that? It's rare. Most people live with a brain injury for the rest of their lives. I mean, it, I don't have any side effects or anything. I did use something else that raised my own uh, stem cells mm. during the last two years, uh, three years now, actually. And that's what actually brought me back. Uh, mm. So because at my age, I'm 56 now, uh, you... Wow. you only you go through hormonal changes, you know, and so the 
the, the you don't put, we don't produce stem cell, young stem cell like we did in our twenties. You know, it's just the way it is. Family <laughs> wrinkles and everything changes. I had like a big hole here. Uh, I lost lots of hair. I mean, there's a lot of things that happens to you. Your wow. body is so depleted. The uh, the vitamins go into the brain. The body is trying. The brain is trying to repair. So every the it's like having a pregnancy. You probably can relate to that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, what I've heard, uh, you know, uh, sometimes women will lose their hair because all, everything goes into, you know, building the, the, the new the baby. baby that comes right. in. Yeah, yeah. And so the women get depleted in vitamins because it's all about the baby. So it's the same here, but with the brain, you know, it's, it's similar. I don't know if it's the same, but it's, I can, that's the analogy. So, um, it sounds yeah, similar so to I, women that have heard lost their hair um, during pre pregnancy. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen friends like that. And so everything comes back afterwards. But yeah, so in this case here, I used a, a little device that's a wearable technology. And I, that's on my website. I have a whole page on that. And um, I just, uh, that really saved me. That brought me back fully. And that was a blessing, a major blessing. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, we're going to get into our personal questions and then wrap it up at 11 because I have an appointment to go to shortly. <laughs> so no for number nine, um, if money wasn't a factor, what would you do with your time? Gosh. <laughs> uh, if money wasn't a factor, um, I'd probably move near the beach. I miss <laughs> being near the ocean, somewhere yes. where it's not too crowded. Uh, probably not California, <laughs> but uh, somewhere where I can have a little shack or something, uh, you know, not, not too much to upkeep. But, um, and I don't know, I would definitely focus on the, on the book and getting it uh, published <clears throat> much faster than what I'm doing right now, because I still have to make a living. So, um, you know, it's, you have so much time during the day. As we do, yes. <laughs> All right, so your next question is, um, what's your favorite movie and what does it reveal about you? Gosh, All right. I'm very bad at all these things. <laughs> all <those tricks. laughs> fine. What's my favorite movie? Uh, I probably have a lot, but uh, I love uh, something that Americans can relate to is uh, Les Miserables. Oh. Les Miserables. Yes, so, I don't think I've seen it though. Yeah, okay, well, it's an old, it's an old movie as far as um, uh, French people are concerned, but um, it has a beautiful um, message that it, it, it's, uh, it's about this man who actually stole bread, I'll tell you briefly, stole bread uh, to feed his family and feed himself, and they were yeah, very poor. And so he uh, he got arrested for that, and he was sent to the to the uh, to you know to prison. And but not just a regular prison; it's those prisons like in uh, San Quentin or th oh, those big prisons where you never prison. come out. Yeah, got it. And so anyway, so there's a whole story behind it, and he was a really good person. And so you know, the, he comes out, he actually escapes. There's Mary Ode, can you hear me? Because you froze. Oh. Yeah, can you uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you said so. He escapes, and he's a good person. And, and what happened after that? Oh, you know what? I think uh, you need to go see the movie. <laughs> oh, okay, I need to see the movie. So the, the second part of that question was, what does it reveal about you? Um, I always. Uh, I always have a, a heart for the the people, the underdog, I should say, the people who are suffering. I have to actually, I'm a kind of an empath. I think uh, I can officially say that I have to, I have to learn. I've had to learn how to detach and not involve myself. 
mm. uh, too much. You know, everybody has an experience they got to go through and all that. But I, I, my heart goes out to, you know, people who are suffering or having a difficult time. And I always want to help. But, <clears throat> but sometimes when we do that, get too involved, we rob the person from their own experience that they need to have to learn about yeah. how to get out of this. So, uh, uh, what I'm learning is to give them the support, but not do it for them or not, you know, they have to find out for themselves what works. That is so, so good. Yeah, Can you repeat that good. again? Repeat that just one more time because that was so good. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, how, being an empath, you just want to help others to uh, to be well and happy and have what they want. And when they're going through a broken, I mean, a, a difficult situation, uh, instead of jumping in and uh, trying to do it with them or to even do it for them, um, you have to step back and take a moment and to support them so you don't carry their weight, but they can go through their own experience and learn the lesson they need to learn along the way. We all have lessons to learn. And each experience, like my experience, was heavy. But at the same time, the way it turned out is I, I, I went within even deeper, which serves me even more. So I would never change the experience, even though I, I wished I had had a daddy or... Uh, or somebody in my life at that time to like a spouse, it would have been a great help to have, but I lived alone. So I, somehow I managed, wow. uh, I don't know. How. <laughs> Thank you for those words of wisdom. So your last question, my dear, um, because yeah, people do take on burdens that don't belong to them. And yes. um, it's important to identify what, you know, what your purpose is served for that time, which is just to leave some wisdom to share support, but not be the support system. Yeah, not be, yes, yes. Not for them to think um, you have all the answers and, and they do nothing about finding their own answers because really all the answers are inside of us. Everything mm -hmm. is within us. We just have to dig in and it's not always easy, of course, and, but we have to start somewhere and we got to do it. So. Yeah, I'm I'm still asking those questions too because you said something about detachment that um, it's, it's just still something that for me to work on in my experience in my journey. So, <laughs> in for your last question, is there any question you wish I'd asked you? Um, no, I mean there's so much more we could talk about. Not at all. I think this is pretty. You know, it, it tells a lot. Of course, there's much more to explain. And <laughs> our stories are full in general, I think, for most people. So uh, an hour of interview is very hard to uh, summarize everything. Okay. No, no I think Right. So, Mario, can you and please say about, uh, about what you were mentioning just earlier? Um, everything is work in progress. It's not like one and done kind of thing. I always try to remind people that it's like, it's work in progress where, you know, it's about evolution and changing and growing. It's not like, okay, I get this now and that's it. No, no nothing like that. <laughs> I, um, I thought, cause last week I had an experience with my daughter and, um, she was the reason that I wrote my book. Um, and, I had thought that I had overcome this area with her until, because the time that I wrote my book, it was a challenging time as a parent because she was in her teens and now she's an adult. And we had this a scuffle like last week or the week before. And then after I had gone over it and I had overcome it, I just thought to myself like, dang, this thing really never changes. Like you will always be presented with an obstacle. You will always, and not just obstacle, if I say it that way and look at it that way, it will be that, but a lesson to help us sharpen ourselves. That's right, that's right. Yeah, if you yeah, if you insist on it being a, a, a problem, then it is a problem. Right. Meanwhile, uh, you know, if, eventually we rise above the situation and it's, it can happen, but it's not a big deal. It's just like, okay, yeah, I can yeah. deal with that. <laughs> we I like it, I like it. 
<laughs> right? I like it. I like it. We are women of strength. Um, so please, please let everyone know where they can find you on your social media. And then um, once I'm done with the podcast, I'll download it and have all your contact information in there. And, that's oh, and also, too, what new things are coming up for you that you can share with people? So, okay, yes. Uh, so you can find me on YouTube at The Eclectic French Yogini. And um, that's my YouTube channel. Uh, so far, I just have uh, videos of yoga, but I will be talking more about the brain injury and many different tips that I will offer. And then um, <clears throat> on how to heal and uh, different approaches that I used. Uh, as well, you can find me on Instagram at The Eclectic French. That's my handle. And... Um, my email address is uh, Mary Ode, my first name, at the eclectic French .com. So I have a website as well, the, the eclectic French .com. I know it's a little long, but uh, that's what I came up with because it made sense to me. <laughs> well, that's uh, all that really matters. matters. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's coming up is uh, I'm putting packages together um, for, to help people to recover from their brain injury where I will do some one-on-one -on -one with them and give them um, a structure to follow and to help them recover from their brain injury and, or, and to, or to just navigate the brain injury while they're going through it, you know. So do you also offer these sessions remotely? Yes, absolutely. Um, this will be actually an online course. Uh, I mean, course one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's, it's more like a workshop. And um, I also offer health coaching online as well. Um, I, do, uh, I have a home studio here, so I do see clients uh, as well uh, at home. But uh, yes, I'm trying to move my business a little bit more online and more worldwide. So okay. it's work in progress as well. <laughs> well, I think it's already worldwide because we're on the World Wide Web. <laughs> 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 All right, my darling, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your presence, your wisdom, and uh, please continue to share um, just these nuggets of freedom that offer people a little, a little bit more direction in their own lives for their own clarity. Thank you very much, Fran. It's it was wonderful to uh, be with you t this morning. All right. And I hope to do it again at some point. Oh, of course, you will be a uh, what do you what do they say a frequent not like a frequent <laughs> player, a frequent visitor. <laughs> All right, my darling. Have a great rest of your day. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.